What our society needs now is the same thing that our society has needed since the fall of man. It's the same thing that is needed when uh, Noah was on the earth and he built the ark. What society needed, and it's the same thing throughout all generations, what society has always needed is the love of God. And that's where we're going to start this series with. We're going to actually go through three things over the next three weeks. Love, peace, and then kindness. Now, I could go through all of the fruits of the Spirit, and we can, we can do a nine-week if, if, it, if it got to that. But these are the three that the Lord put on my heart to, to share with you uh, the next three weeks. So uh, we're going to look at that. Look at chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 19 here in just a moment. Now, there's something that I have been saying, and I, and I really believe this to be true. The very thing that can help people the most is the very thing that they reject the most. Did you get that? The very thing that can help people the most is the very thing that they reject the most. And what is it that they reject? Folks, it's none other than the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we look at, as we think about that, we're going to go to God's Word now. We're going to look at what society needs right now. In Galatians chapter 5, look at verse 19. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfishness, heresies, it's not getting any better, is it? Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And really what we have here is a picture of the natural man. Folks, we are all born sinners. Not a one of you in this room was born uh, perfect. We are all born sinners. We all have that sin nature that is deep within our hearts and deep within our lives. And that's exactly uh, what happens at, at birth. Now the Holy Spirit here has set forth a picture of an adulterous, a foul, an idolatrous, a, a wicked, uh, full of witchcraft, full of drugs, full of all kinds of things uh, that we find in our society. But I want you to notice something. God did not intend man to be like that. God didn't create Adam and Eve to, to be sinners. Did you realize that? They were in a perfect place. They were in a place uh, called the Garden of Eden, and, and God placed them there, and God had an incredible fellowship with them. And then someone else appeared in the form of a serpent, and his name was Satan, the devil, the accuser, the, the deceiver. He, he came, and he's the one that caused man to become like that. But let me tell you something. The flesh, your flesh and my flesh, is what makes people behave like they behave. And so society is the way it is is because it's full of sinful people. You agree with that? I mean, the Bible says the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? But there can be a difference. There can be a change. And I want you to notice, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and notice with me verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. We will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, and then notice this next word. What is it? But... Notice this, you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Something happened to you. If you're a Christian, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, something happened to you that makes an incredible difference in your life. It says, first of all, you were washed, then you were set apart, you were sanctified, and you were justified just as if you had never sinned. That's where God places you positionally in his family. And so you, as part of our society, have an incredible job 
to do. We're going to look at that in our third point tonight, uh, mainly. But I want you to notice something here. Go back to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to finish. Uh, we're going to look at verse uh, 22. We see that word but again. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such there is no law. Now, every single one of those should be growing within your life. You should be mastering those in your life. You should be uh, maturing in those areas in your life. And as Pastor Mike has said many times, it seems like that one about patience is the hardest one to, uh, to master or to, to mature in. But we are, God has set us apart to do that very thing. Now the word but here is a hinge upon which great truths turn. You see that uh, there in uh, verse 19 it said the works of the flesh are evident, but the fruit of the Spirit is. Now the fruit of the Spirit should be evident in your life, amen? It must be evident in your life. Now the word fruit comes from a word karpos, and this word is very important. It's, and In this particular context it's used to describe that which is produced in you, in your life as a believer, by the energy of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is the one who comes in and invades your life at the point of salvation. And through the Holy Spirit of God, God dwells with you. We'll talk some more about that in just a moment. And so we're going to talk tonight about uh, three things that uh, uh, our society needs uh, right now. And the first one is this. Our society, and this is the uh, part of the uh, outline if you want to look at that, and you probably have a sheet of paper there in your hand, and it'll be on the board as well. Our society, first of all, needs a first-hand recognition of the love of God. The first-hand recognition of the love of God. Now, back in the 60s, now I was born in 62, so I don't remember a whole lot about the 60s, but I go back and I, and I remember... And I looked up the words to this song, and it was a song written by Burt Bacharach. And Brother Mike, you probably know the lyrics to this. You know all the lyrics back then. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's much too little of. How many of y'all remember this song? All of you. Y'all were, most of y'all were born before the 60s, right? Okay. Then it goes on to say what the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not for some, but for everyone. Now that is a great concept. Yeah, the world needs love, but I want you to know tonight that the world has a warped sense of what love really is. The world practices an, an eros kind of love, an erotic kind of love. We see that abound on television or on billboards or whatever. You see it everywhere. But also the world, our society, is, is uh, uh, practicing phileo love. It's a friendship kind of love, and that is awesome. But folks, what this world, what our society needs more of today and need most of today is agape love. They need God's love. Because the love that we practice in our society, if you want to really be honest about it, is a conditional kind of love. Now you as a Christian, you know better than that. As a Christian, you know that you are you're to treat everybody with unconditional love because that is what agape love is. That's what God's love produces. And so society's looking for something. They're looking for answers. They're looking not just for religion. I don't think they're looking for a church or they're looking for a special meeting. What they're looking for is something that can change their life. And the thing that can change their life as it has changed your life is the love of God. And so we're going to go now. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 4. This is the, the body of the message tonight. We're going to see the definition of love in 1 John chapter 4. So if you would turn there, we're going to spend some time here in 1 John uh, chapter 4, beginning in verse number 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. Now, now get that in your mind. Lots and lots of people in our world do not know God, so therefore they don't know what love is. And then we get the great definition of love. It says, for God is love. Now, Scripture didn't say here God can love, although we know that He does. It doesn't say that God will love, although He does. What it says is God is love. 
He is the very epitome of what love is. It's his nature, it's his character, it's his makeup. And folks, that's what society needs. They need a firsthand experience or firsthand uh, knowledge or recognition of the love of God. Now here's what I find, and, and I find this in talking and witnessing with people. Many people in our society have intellectual knowledge of God. And it's great to have that kind of knowledge. It's great to, to uh, learn all that you can about God. But here's the thing. Many of them have never experienced an experiential kind of love. And that experience that they can have is a, an experience with the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to paraphrase it like this. I'm not changing Scripture. I just, this is just what God put on my heart. 1 John 4, 8. The person who does not have this divine kind of love has never entered into a personal experiential knowledge of God. What they know is in their heads, but it has never got into their hearts. Now, I know I'm speaking to the choir tonight, so to speak, and you are very godly and faithful people, but even if there's one person in this room tonight that only has head knowledge and you don't have the heart knowledge, I pray God will convict your heart and convict your life this very night. Because, folks, it's not about what's up here. It's what's in here that's going to make the difference. You want to get fruit and start be producing fruit, then the seed's got to be in the heart because that's where it's going to grow. And so people need a, a real firsthand recognition of the love of God. So we need to, as a society, we need to see what God's done for them. And I just have two verses. These are very uh, popular verses. You've heard it many, many times. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then John 3, 16, you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Folks, our society needs that everlasting life, but they can only get it through the love of God. So verse number 8 tells us and gives us the definition of love. God is love. Now secondly, our society needs a firsthand revelation of the love of God. Now I want you to notice here in verse 9 of 1 John chapter 4, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, in this particular passage, we see uh, what love is, but now we're going to see who love is. In this particular passage, in verse number 9, we see that Jesus Christ is revealed into the world. Now, I love this from J.D. Walt. J.D. Walt, and I quote him, he said, Jesus is a place where the Word of God and person of God are revealed in perfect union. Let me say that one more time. Jesus is a place where the Word of God and the person of God are revealed in perfect union. So in this, as verse 9 says, the love of God was manifested toward us. So our society needs a firsthand revelation of the love of God. So we see what it is. It's love. Now we see who it is. It is Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. It says here he is described as the only begotten Son of God. One of a kind, unique. No one else has ever uh, been like Jesus. No one else has ever been virgin born. No one else has ever lived a perfect life. Only Jesus. And that's what the world needs. They need to understand who he is. And because God is love, he must communicate not only uh, in words, but he must communicate in deeds. Because love is never static. Love is always active. It's never inactive. I love this word manifested. It actually means this to come out in the open and to be made public. And boy, did God ever do that. 
on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross. We're the dearest and best for the world of lost sinners. What does it say? He was slain. You see, God came out in, into public, into the public arena, in the public, in the in the societal arena, and he showed his love as it was manifested through Jesus Christ. John the Apostle, he writes in John 15, verse 13, he says this about Jesus, greater love is no one than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. You see, Jesus was all about manifesting the love of God. It was all about coming out and showing who God is. There was never a road too rough. There was never a way too long. There was never an appeal too faint. There was never a case too hard. There was never a cry that was too late. God always, Jesus always found a way to show love. It was a Pharisee named Nicodemus that came to him at night. It was a woman at a well that came to him at high noon. It was a dead girl. It was a demon-possessed boy. It was a leprous man. They all came to Jesus. There was a, it was a woman who had an issue of blood, and he found time to be with them. He found time to manifest his love. I love this. It was Nathaniel. You remember the story of Nathaniel when he's under the fig tree. But it was also Zacchaeus up in a sycamore tree. It was a multitude that was hungry. It was a wedding that, that, that was running out of wine. It was a, a mom who lost her only son. And folks, Jesus was always there manifesting the love of God and showing them the love of God. So Jesus was about declaring the truth that God is love. But Jesus also taught it as well. He taught his disciples over and over and over to love one another. We saw that in, in 1 John chapter 4, that we're to love one another. I love what David said in, in uh, Psalm 51 after he had confessed and after he had been cleansed of the, the sin in which he, sins in which he had committed. And he said this, he said, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. So not only are we to have the love of God dwelling in us, but we are to have the love of God extending from us just like Jesus did. So our society needs a first-hand recognition of the love of God. They need a first-hand revelation of the love of God. And thirdly, our society needs a first-hand reminder of the love of God. And folks, this is where the pavement really hits the road right here. This is where we come in, okay? This is where we really need to pay attention to what God is saying. And I want to give you something that I want you to either write down, you can write it on that paper, or just try to, try to remember this. A Christian ought to be what God is. And God is love. Am I right? Am I just throwing darts that are not hitting anything? I mean, it's, it's so important that we, we need to be like God. And the Bible says that God is love. Now, the truth of, that God is love is revealed in His Word. We understand that. We also find, and we, we saw just a moment ago, that the love of God is revealed, and it was revealed at the cross of Jesus Christ. But there's one other area in which the love of God must be revealed. And what happens is God does something in us. This is why it's important that you have a daily walk with the Lord every single day because God is wanting to do something in you. So in order that you can do something for someone else and show someone else the love of God. Look in verse 11 of 1 John. I'm going to read through verse 16. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we, we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and we believe that love that believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Now I know that's a lot to, to take in. But as I was thinking about and as I was reading that and even was reading this this morning, this thought came to me. So that's what it's all about. What I just read is what it's all about. It's really what God has planned. It's really what God has in store. God wants a relationship with everyone. Every man, woman, boy, and girl that's ever been born or ever will be born, God wants a relationship with them. And it's because he's love. You know what? God does have a desire to live in us. You realize that, right? So I want to, for just a moment, I want to, I want to trace some of God's dwelling places that are found in the Word of God. In the beginning, as I mentioned there in the Garden of Eden, God had fellowship with man in a perfect place. The Bible says that God came and walked in the cool of the day with Adam. Can you imagine what that was, was all about? Mike, wouldn't that have been cool just to have been there in even before he named the animals, and maybe even before the animals were, you know, uh, mentioned, you know, God came in the cool of the day, and he was there. And what a blessed time they were having. And then Satan comes in in the form of that serpent, and, and man fell, and Adam and Eve sinned. And the Bible says that God had to sacrifice an animal to cover their sins so they can come back into the fellowship. There has to be a sacrifice for sin, folks. And then we see as we go on through the word that God actually walked with men and men walked with God. We find that he walked with Enoch. We find that he walked with Noah. We find that the word of God tells us that Abraham walked with God. Now, I'd love for God to come down and walk with us today. Well, he does as he is dwelling within us. Then by the time the exodus took place, God didn't simply walk with men. He began to live or dwell with them. And here's what he did. He said in Exodus chapter 25, he said, Moses, let's make a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And so the first of those sanctuaries was the tabernacle. And when Moses dedicated it, the glory of God came down and moved into the tent. You imagine what that would have been like. God dwelt in the camp, but he didn't dwell in bodies of the individual Israelites at that time. Then it happened, as it happened many, many times, the nation of Israel sinned against God. They turned their back on God. And the Bible says, and Ezekiel says, that God's glory departed. However, God began to use men like Samuel and men like David to restore the nation. And then we find as we go on that Solomon built an incredible temple so that the presence of God would be there again. And so at that dedication, the glory of God once again came to dwell in the land. But again, as history repeated itself time after time, they sinned against God. And the glory departed, and the temple was actually destroyed. You know the story. You've read it. But did the glory, folks, ever return? I'm going to tell you something. It returned in a way that is so incredible. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1 that the Word became flesh. Are you hearing me? The Word became flesh. And dwelt among us. Now there's something different about that. 
He came now, he is now, the glory of God now dwells within the bodies of God's children. The Bible says you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. I hope you never take that for granted. I hope that's something special in your life because it needs to be. Now God reveals himself through the lives of his children. So we can remind people every single day through our lives, through our living, through our words, through our actions. We can remind people today of the love of God. Now I've got just a few minutes, but I want to I want to share these scriptures with you because this is some things that Jesus says that's so important. Look at Matthew chapter 22. Jesus said to him, this, this teacher, this lawyer comes to him and asks him, which is the great commandment? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Now that's the Shema there in the book of Deuteron Deuteronomy, but now it's extended here as he adds something to it. He said, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, listen, if you're supposed to be like God, then you're to love your neighbor like God does. Right? Let's notice in John 13. Look at John chapter 13. Verse number 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Then back in Matthew chapter 5, look at Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to close here in just a moment. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 44. Now this one's a little tougher, but Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. I'm going to tell you, society will not love you, and the society that is driven by Satan, will never love a Christian. But God says we're to love them. We're to love our enemies. Look at 1 John chapter 3. Back to 1 John. Chapter 3, verse 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and, what's it say? In truth. And then 1 Corinthians 16, 14 just simply says this. And what a challenge this is. Let all that you do be done with love. God is here. Let's remind people daily of the love of God everywhere we go. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the love that you have demonstrated, the love that you have manifested in this world. And Father, I know society is hurting and society is wicked, but society does need, they need you. And they need to know, first of all, about your love. So, Lord, I pray that we can be a reminder to them as we live for you and as we share your love, your heart, through our heart, to each and every one we come in contact with. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.